Well, hello everyone, Thomas, Javier. It's always wonderful to have you, Michelle and I, uh, OG Rose, and we're so thrilled uh, to be having a conversation today on the philosophy of glimpses, which uh, everyone should know actually emerged out of, what was it, like a two hour conversation that we were talking about metaphysics and philosophy and the, the great Zoom uh, forces just decided to destroy that conversation, but it all worked out because that motivated a, a book, a little treatise that we, we put up to sort of talk about it. Because it seems today um, that the, it, metaphysics is such a loaded word. Like the moment you mention metaphysics, a lot of people have knee jerk reactions to it. You know, people, some people view it as a simile for theology. Some people view it as, oh, we got rid of it with positivism in different things like that. So it's really important, I think, today to really kind of, what is it that we talk about when we talk about metaphysics? And we, we, we also really, in our conversation, decided that it's important to see metaphysics um, using a methodology of phenomenology. And what phenomenology is, is kind of the study of what things are like, more so how things unfold versus saying what something is. Uh, we all know from Kant that it's very difficult to uh, get to the thing itself, to, to, uh, to talk about whatever is across the noumenon. But that certainly doesn't mean that we can't talk what things are like. And the fact that if things unfold in X way versus Y way, then that would give us reason to think that the thing is more like X than like Y because it unfolds a certain way. And that in that sense, if the metaphysical is something that we cannot directly observe in the physical or it's something that transcends the physical in some way, even if it has traces of it, then we're always going to be talking about something that you can't get at entirely perhaps, or that there's always something that's left out, even if, even if it's present. Uh, but today we tend to think that if you can't get at it entirely, it doesn't exist. But of course, this is, this is kind of what we're, we're critiquing. That's what we're getting at. Uh, and certainly things like beauty or love or words or freedom or a bunch of the different topics we discuss are things that you, the, the more you get to know of them, the more you find there's more to know. And so that there's more to explore and you keep going. And rather than just assume, oh, that's because, you know, there's nothing there. It's endlessly deferring as sort of Derrida said. It's like, well, no, no, no. It's, um, it's metaphysical, meaning that there's a substance that as you get to know it, as you chase that form, uh, you find that there's more to that form that's unveiling, uh, that's, that's unfolding. Um, the book will also, the treatise has that section on why we think Derrida didn't deconstruct all metaphysics. And to put it generally, it's because Derrida may take out metaphysical systems that rely on ontological gaps, but he does not, um, in our view, deconstruct metaphysics that are based on apprehension, the act of going, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's a cat. You know, maybe we can't uh, determine what the platonic cat is based on a um, accidental or particular manifestation of the cat. But the very fact that we're able to apprehend something, uh, that we're able to get it, that the what, what Aristotle would put as sort of the, um, the, the substance, the, the, the essence and the form that they all align in that thing is something that's worth metaphysical uh, consideration. Then, we're, then we focus on lacks and how we want to have a metaphysics that's focused on the phenomenology of lacks. And Mr. Jockin is quite good on that, very good on that, uh, describing a lack as a, an absence that has a form. It's lacks are not nothing is the phrase that we like. And, and then we'll go from there on to question kind of the idea of how lacks suggest how humans actually have free, free will then open up on a, how, what are some of the things that we might be able to experience uh, as these uniquely metaphysical beings and the treatise will put the meta in parentheses as metaphysical beings that we exist in the sort of between space. What are the, some of the things that we can uniquely experience and what that would exactly mean. And, and hopefully the treatise will, will open a whole lot of inquiries. Uh, Javier has done some wonderful work. Jockin has done some addendums. You'll find those on, on YouTube as, as has Javier on how this can kind of expand in our thinking. Um, it's also, I think, really critical because, uh, you know, one of the points I was thinking about this afternoon, you know, so often people will hear metaphysics and sort of assume that, oh, that's going to get into, um, you know, theology and get you into God and different things like that. And it certainly can. But it's also important to realize that if the experience of beauty gives you um, reason to think that there's something more to beauty, perhaps what metaphysics, even if you don't accept a God premise, just the very experience of metaphysics is of a thing that has a conditionality that in order to get the fullness of it, you have to lean into it. You have to experience it more so. And if that's the case and you automatically discount uh, metaphysics from your system, then maybe in this life, there's something more to beauty that you're never going to actually experience unless you lean into it, unless you assent to it. Maybe there's something more to love. Uh, maybe there's something more to freedom, words, all these different things that you don't experience unless you're willing to lean into that system and see where it takes you. So to also think of metaphysics in terms of 
higher uh, perceptive abilities, the ability to perceive the world more fully and in different ways, to think of it as a source of more meaning, as a source of more wonder. If it really is the case that beauty is a thing that you have to assent to and lean into, uh, let it pull you forward in order to get higher and higher understandings of beauty, then rather you take that to some theological conclusion or not, that is something that you're going to want to investigate because I've never met anyone who wishes their life had less beauty in it or less goodness in it or less truth in it. These are all things that if you were, they're very interesting because it's, you know, you can have too much food, right? You can eat too much food, but it's hard to imagine having too much goodness, uh, too much beauty. You know, you could have an infinite amount of these things and it would get better and better. And if, one, in choosing to discount metaphysics is missing out on these infinite sources of um, wonder in life because they're afraid it's going to lead to them to some sort of theological conclusion. Uh, that would be quite tragic if indeed these are things that as we have in our life, uh, they become an infinite source of, of motivation and wonder. So that, that's something, because you know there was some comments on the, on the treatise about that, that I think is just really important to note. I mean, you have that uh, philosopher who wrote uh, After Finitude, Quentin M., who talks about kind of the uh, uh, ontological background that could be in reality that we're missing out. Or you have Kurt Gödel talking about mathematics as platonic forms. You know, there can be this higher scaffolding to, to being that we can be entirely missing out on if we're not willing to lean into these metaphysical possibilities because we've decided Derrida deconstructed them or we've kind of assumed that something you can't completely observe, therefore does not exist. Um, so anyway, that's an overview of the treatise and we were just going to get together and sort of talk about it today, this evening, and hopefully Zoom will be good to us. Uh, and good thing it wasn't last time because that stimulated the whole project. So, so, uh, so it's great to see you gentlemen again. It's always good to see y'all. It's really fun about this context, right? That we had a meeting, we had a convening, discussion and it was not and it, we lost the recording and it led to a text right a text and then even more importantly the audio text of forms led to addendums by uh, myself and javier i think the it's just been a very fun experience quite frankly i think it's been a really innovative methodology in philosophy just to explore uh, this power to like kind of prose hence like the idea we can kind of stand individually but also collectively and there's a richer story told up by that collapse, that individual expressions as well as that unifying vehicle, right? Of the addendum style. And even now this, because I feel like, um, you know, a really good philosophical project does tend to demand more of us as the more we commit to it, the more it demanded of us. I definitely, I personally feel this way. I feel like we've gone through this journey of, the, of this text. And I think I am left with much projects to talk about and things that I uh, want to explore further. Uh, so that's very exciting from my point of view. Best way to handle this in terms of which, because obviously the, everyone, can, anyone who's watching this can look at the addendums and the text itself, right? And I think Daniel did a very good job summarizing his main text ideas. Um, I guess I, I can build on it on terms of what I added. Um, I think the first couple parts was, I think the discussion of lack as not nothing, basically as this kind of no being behind it. I think that's a very important part because, I mean, my, I come from Aristotelian, uh, Thomistic, Islamic point of view tradition. Um, the basic argument of natural theology, now obviously, again, we said here, we don't have to go down that route, but this argument that from sense from sense perception we can we can reason through to see these ultimate realities of existence and i think beauty goodness and truth are the primary modes we can talk about that um, does demand then how can we get to from appearances to something substantial and if we acknowledge that we can't get to the nomina right these kind of explicitly the things we're talking about and and those lacks have causal powers, building a foundation, a real foundation for giving our classification of these claims. And even in, in a society and culture that generally denies um, kind of cultural moral absolutes to say like, no, this is what we're claiming this is and actually reason from lacks and come from apprehensions of those, of these categories or just even other points that say that quite frankly, lacks are not nothing because they have causal powers, right? That's one of the major arguments in the addendums I made. And I think it actually is very powerful. 
Um, it was the idea that sometimes the lack of something actually gives you cause, like lack of support of a, of a bridge, for example. That's real. It's, it has act, activity in the world and it has a co consequences because of that. Um, one of the actually major, I think, actually fun things about the, the project was the OG Rose as a group was basically making the argument of, of kind of um, subjective lack, right? Kind of apprehension of your own subjective awareness of lack of stuff are different ways and how you also build on that too. Um, I'm getting much more from this more objective argument that like in material reality, um, lacks exist, absences are real and they are necessary for any account to exist uh, for what world. And it's a premise, I think, um, I think everyone here in this group has sees the potential of this being very powerful and giving accounts for really how we live our lives and what's missing. Uh, generally, because I, and I always love this when they went in original conversations with Daniel, particularly uh, when we talked about writing in that sense that great writing points to a lack. It points, it doesn't make itself so apparent and so explicit. It's almost dead when it's over, overtly apparent when it's trying to say. It should point to some kind of lack instead. And that's really what gives us a vitality and life and energy behind it. It's that pointing to a lack. Right, and I you, oh, we we analogized about it because we talked about in writing versus typography, um, letter form making. It's all about that awareness of lack, absence, and space in between things. Um, and we'll get that, that analogy and mode to then talk about a much larger project and even this discussion. Right, the reason why for not, at least for me phenomenology is an interesting mode is because this likeness is. Uh, course of analogy, right, metaphor and analogy that I think is very powerful and generally um, uh, Tom uh, Aristotle talks about it, Plato a little bit, Thomas Aquinas has some parts to it, he contradicts, he flips and he changes his mind on the nature of analogy in a lot of ways. Um, Katagin was a major thinker of analogy, um, really more of a summarization and, they, and people even disagree about his, was his summarization of Aquinas' arguments of analogy reasonable or the same as a consequences or not or different or innovations. Um, and then it was um, F, um, J.F. Rose, I believe, I forgot his, he wrote another treatise on analogy. That's it, that's really all we have <laughs> in terms of systematic attempts to talk about analogy. But I think uh, this essay series, even talked about, we talked about that a little bit too and I thought that was really powerful. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Javier to take it from here, but I definitely, like I said, I was a lot of, there's a lot of more projects to this series that I would love to explore more on that I'll, I'll yield for my next round to talk about that. So, or Michelle, actually, I forgot now the order, actually. I apologize. Yeah, okay. 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 I'll jump in here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Um, thank you, Daniel. Um, no, the project has been delightful and very entertaining actually to see unfold, you know, which is kind of actually true to the, the very core of what we're doing is to see the unfolding. Um, I, I appreciate especially the idea that it seems that a lack is a nothing that does something to you. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like a nothing that you engage with. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, there's something that is like nothing about a lack, but it, it is different and it's that type of engagement which is so so powerful and so so important to, to recognize and um i in javier and what you shared with with uh beauty and lack i was particularly kind of drawn into that that um argument you're making there and at first at first i thought to myself well like a beauty is lack like what I was just like, what, what do you mean? It's not there? Like, what do we, you know, and it was, it was, this is a moment of like, okay, well, the our whole project is surrounded by, by trying to trace out the lack. So I better start to understand what this has to do with beauty. But I thought, I think um, your dentums really articulated it very well, Javier. And I think that what I really appreciated about that was that it is this um, lack that actually leads to fulfillment. And the, the, the image that kept on coming to mind as I listened was like a suction cup. Because like a suction cup, if you look at it, it's just no space. There's nothing there, okay? Mm -hmm. But when you, when you like lean into it, it's the pressure. It's the engagement with that space, that, mm -hmm. that negative space that, that then sucks you in. You know, there's a suction there and it, and it 
pulls you. It pulls you in that direction. Hmm. And that's what I thought was so, so good in, in the beauty discussion. I mean, obviously you talk about it a lot in terms of possession versus responsibility, the response, but see, that's what a response is. The responsibility, the answer is to be able to lean in and allow yourself to kind of go uh, and allow the conversation to happen, which is again, kind of funny because we're allowing this conversation to happen, right? On what is, you know, the meta metaphysics of glimpses. So I really like that, that image kept coming to mind. And you know, the thing is that you either have that type of section or, or life just kind of sucks. I mean, it's like, it's like, well, this, it's just like, there's nothing like, it, it's just like nihilism or, you know, like <laughs> not good. nothing, nothing's really like, you know, pulling you along, you know, except like, I got, I don't know your depression, which I, you know, I guess you're just like, well, I guess I'll go another day feeling that way. Your hunger, <laughs> yeah, I know. food. <laughs> yeah, well, food always draws That's me. Good. Food yeah. is good, yeah. <laughs> As I said, you said earlier, like too much food. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You can have it. I, like, I was like, there's infinite beauty. There's infinite food. There's infinite I'll take it as one of the infinites. But anyways, but the, the point is, is that if you, you know, it's like, you're still going to get some type of sucking. And it's either going to be that, you know, life just is going to suck because you haven't, you're not maybe uh, leaning into that feel that leaning into the nothing. Okay. If you don't lean into it, then you're just sort of there. And um, it's okay to be there. I think most people have, and most people will. And that's kind of important because it actually can be that moment that then initiates the leaning into and, and the encounter with that, you know, pr that pressure into the suction that is these, this lack actually. Mm -hmm which then will pull you, pull you, pull you into that. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a moth to light imagery too. I mean, this is, this is what we're, we're attracted to or drawn into. And it's, um, it's something that I think you have to have an allowance for, um, you know, be, be open to, which, which a lot has to do with the perception actually, which is discussed quite a bit in, in these, in the videos, especially on phenomenology. Um, the perception is so key to allowing yourself to have this constant dialectic with just, the meditation, but then also the, um, the, the thinking. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that was something I wanted to bring up. And then I also wanted to bring up about this idea of the glimpses themselves, this word that we're using for the philosophy, you know, part of, I think, being open to the leaning in, um, is, it is accepting that it's glimpses. It's, it's not con a it's not a constant exposure, okay? Then you would never get pictures. If, you, if, it's, if there's constant exposure, it, it's like just a blob. If you took a camera and you like just let, let the, the lens be open the whole time, it's a constant exposure. You just, you don't get anything. There's it's nothing, over it's overexposure, yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that's sometimes what we desire. Like we want to have a metaphysics that's like this, this like the possession, like Javier, you'll talk a lot about, like you want something that you can hold and you want something that's constant because the glimpses is something you have to really uh, be, res you have to let go of a lot. You have to just kind of be like, that's what the image that I love is like the suction cup on your head kind of drawing you forward and your hands are just kind of like, it's out of my hands. <laughs> you know, it's like, you're just kind of being, sorry, Daniel. <laughs> it's out of my yeah, hands. Yeah, it's out of your hands. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that the, the accepting that it, it's like the sun, it rises and falls. You have no control over that, but it does go and it does come again. And I think that we have to be able to like accept it, or at least I think what we're endeavoring to do with this philosophy is to accept the tension of here and not here, of, of the perception and the thinking. And when we accept that, then we can actually have, like if we're using the camera analogy again, we can actually have, instead of like either completely overexposed pictures or underexposed pictures where we have no definition or over definition as in like, you know, which ultimately would just be completely a blob is we have these crisp, crisp glimmers and, and glimpses um, of, of, you know, of beauty, of goodness, of truth. And so I think um, it, it often reminds me of this, this sine wave, you know, it's, it's, it comes and it goes and you can't hold it, but you can witness it. You can, you can behold it. Um, but, you have to also accept it too, that it won't be uh, constant in the way that maybe you're just solely your thought would be in terms of a philosophy, yeah, right? Like your thought and your perception is happening in this, in this dance, in this up, down, in this here, there, yeah. Or here, not here, here, not here, here. And so 
which I think we do in thought, like, you know, the paper on perception and thinking does that, like, you're, you're here in the room, but then you think about your grandma, and then you're kind of not in the room, but you are in the room at the same time, and it's a very interesting thing that our minds can do, um, which maybe gets into the idea of, like, our orientation towards lack, and the fact that we kind of indicates that we have this free will, yeah. but um, those were really the main points that I really wanted to bring out, because when I, when Javier talked about beauty for me it was like it really kind of clicked a bit more on this idea of the lack and how we can have an experience of lack and how it actually does sort of compel us and kind of in this more continual instead of the constant it's the continual um so so those are my thoughts and um thank you all for sharing so far looking forward to hearing as we continue Thank you, Michelle and and Daniel and Thomas for all these these thoughts. Uh, you know, the first thing that you said, Daniel, about Derrida and the ontological gap. I was thinking that that's kind of like what we made <laughs> lacks become. Like we made ontologically ourselves the ontological gap. <laughs> we we became the ontological gap. Why talk about the ontological gap? when we are the ontological gap. Um, and it's always interesting, and I'm honestly fascinated, always fascinated about, because my, my main concern usually for my own topics is how do we relate to one another? And how do we make this always more relatable? And, and, it, and if you wanna look at lack as something real, um, we can talk about helplessness. I think helplessness is a perfect position to talk about lack, right? Because helplessness, you can say like, that's not really nothing. There's something there. Helplessness, you could probably say definitely has a form, but what is it about helplessness that is so frustrating? And so as, as human beings, we are always trying to either exploit our helplessness or we're trying to avoid our helplessness and and it's it's never it, it, both of those are not really good things uh, you know the exploiting of your helplessness is someone trying is knowing that they're that people are going to help you and that they will always help you and so you never you could say you never progress right it's like a guy that uh Maybe it's a family member that's always asking for money, right? But he never gets a job because he knows that you guys are going to give him money. So he, in his helplessness, he, he knows that you're always going to help him. But the, the, the paradox is that he's not really helpless, is he? Because he's guaranteed he's going to get help. Um, and so, but what he really needs to lack is his own helplessness. <laughs> what, is, what, what is really not his helplessness Um uh, and and Michelle's thing about uh, beauty, there's something Zizek said, I was watching, he was giving a story about how a man told a woman to lose two or three pounds. He said, if you just lose two or three pounds, you would look perfect, you'd be beautiful, right? And so he told the woman, uh, Zizek told the woman, he said, whatever you do, don't lose those two or three pounds. And And he said this because and, I, and it was very profound, right? Is because once you have that image of, of, a, of you losing two or three pounds, right? Once you become that two or three pounds less, you're going to put another image there. You're always going to be like, well, I could lose two or three pounds more, right? You could always go more, right? And, and so you're always going to be lacking that, whatever you do. And, and, and that's, if anything, I, I would... I think that's like a really good point about my, my beauty part is that you're always going to place something as the image of what you want it to be, right? Your, your version of beauty, your version of whatever it is. Um, if you try to become it, you have to replace it with something else. You always need that lack, you could say, or that gap. You always need that gap. And and I think that's what's painful as human beings is that we always try to fill that gap. Why? You know, why? Why do we want to fill that gap? 
Why is that such a pressing need? Um, and, and that's why I like the whole suction <laughs> analogy because it honestly, it's, it's like lacks, it really does show as Thomas, as Thomas explains that lacks have causal power, right? It, it's the only thing that it makes me attract to the object, right? It's the only thing that it, it's like when someone says, when someone gives me an ideal of what a better person could be like, maybe I've never even met that person, right? And, and we could give, we could bring in some theology. We say like Jesus Christ, right? Never met the guy. Sounds great. I kind of want to be like him. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you hold that image, and there's a lack now. And I want to be like him. But the thing is, if I'm Jesus, then what else can I do? <laughs> I have to put something else there. And it, it's always going to be frustrating, you could say. Uh, but I think the real question is, does it have to be frustrating? And is there a way to... Uh, is there a way to, and then this is where I, I started to really like Adam Phillips, because Adam Phillips talks about patient frustration, which is paradoxical, of course, because when we're frustrated, we're not being patient. Um, and so how do we look at helplessness uh, in terms of a, a more positive light? Um, how do we look at frustration as a more optimal position? <laughs> You know, but as as Adam Phillips would say, a patient frustration, because the only experience that I have of myself is one that is always lacking. There is never a self that I can think of that is actually fully satisfied, and that is the self that I always want, uh, the self that is completely satisfied. And so I'm always torn between a self uh, and experiencing a self that is lacking something i'm always lacking something and that's painful but how do i reinterpret that how do i redescribe that into a position that is uh, of witness you could say of of fulfillment and nothingness um this is the position that we're in we're, we are like we said uh, like i said that we are the ontological gaps themselves which is confusing because no one's really talked about it before in terms of it being like we are that gap. Uh, and, and yeah, I think that's, that's all I got to say. <laughs> no, that, that, that's excellent. And, you know, a few things, what's, what's, what's very interesting is you have lack in the sense of the individual in their, in their subjectivity, in their self feeling like they're missing out on something. And then you have this lack where say, when you experience beauty, potentially you feel like something's unfolding that's bigger than that sunset. And yet all you experience is that sunset. I'm just using the example of the sunset. And what's interesting is it feels like there's a higher something perhaps that's missing from that sunset or that's missing from those experiences of true music and wonder. And uh, those moments of flow where you feel like there's something truer there that's harder to put words into and that's a kind of lack that's a sort of ontological incompleteness there's this feeling of a sort of incompleteness not because the thing in of itself is incomplete but because from your vantage point there's a incompleteness and then you have the lack of yourself where you're like you're you're actually always doing everything in your power to hide the fact that you're lacking from the people around you right in a cycle now and we've done this wonderful series with Cadell kind of on um, lack in psychoanalysis and how interesting it is to examine that. Because then you also have the lack um, that Thomas, is, Mr. Jockin is so good on, on the idea that you have a pile of debris and it was part of a bridge. And now the bridgeness is lacking. The form of the bridge is gone. It's in the object. And Mr. Jockin, you know, we talked about the uh, objective, objective, in the object. There is um, objectively a form that is now missing. And so there's all these senses of lack, right? You have this sort of uh, lack in the object and, uh, and, and you have the lack in the kind of pointing toward a transcendent dimension. And, uh, and you have this lack that's in the psychoanalytical sense. And what's curious is um, if all you have in your conception of philosophy and metaphysics is bringing in more being, more presence, then the name of the game is to deny the existence of all these things, is to say they're not really there because lacks are just nothing. 
So if you think they're there, you're crazy and you need to deny them. Uh, there's no form of a bridge in this pile of debris. It's a pile of debris. There's no, uh, oh, you're, you're feeling helpless right now? Well, you're just lack, you know, just take a pill. You'll feel better, right? Oh, you think there's the beauty there is pointing towards some infinite beauty that you can access, whether you believe in God or not, that there is some sort of higher beauty that you can forever for the rest of your life go toward? Well, that's nuts because I, I don't really experience it. So what we want to do is actually... Uh, present ourselves as having complete being, you know, all the being is, is present, there is no lack, there is no something that is missing, it's all here, and everyone, and it's pretty much you're made to feel is if you didn't get the memo about that, well, then you need to, uh, you know, get, get your, get stuff together, <laughs> you know, you're, you're off, you need to, to get, get the memo and become a um, positivist that denies, that pretends like they, don't have lack because as soon as they get that job promotion, they'll be good to go. And who understands that at the end of the day, beauty is just subjective taste. So we've kind of denied the presence of any sort of um, lack any, uh, in all of those different areas. But there would be very good reason to think, you know, I was kind of had this image of if we talk about the individual lack, sort of what you were saying, Javier, the um, kind of the, uh, the psychoanalytical maybe mind lack. I'm trying to think of a term for this, uh, you know, mind lack or self lack. Let's call it self lack. I'm going to call it self lack. It's almost like self lack is always trying to get out and show everyone you, what you really are. And then you do all these social conventions to hide it, or you try to be cool to hide it. It's trying to get out. So it's like pointing out of you where beauty, when you experience beauty, it's like this lack that's going in where it's incomplete. <laughs> you know, it's like this hole that you could plug up into if only you were to accept that there's sort of a higher possibility there. And it's like, perfect, because then it would fit together. It would be fitting, right? If you kind of follow those images. And the point that we're trying to make in the treatise is someone may hear that and say, oh, well, that's convenient. But no, there's actually a really good philosophical reason if you do the work and you pay attention to how the world unfolds to think that life actually could be like that. And one of the reasons I made a point to sort of say, metaphysics does not have to lead into theology is because for so long, people would assume that if you're talking about metaphysics, certainly maybe there's a reason so many metaphysicians ended up in theology, which should be examined. But even if you don't go that far, reality could still be such where there's something about beauty that you can plug into with that lack that's trying to come out of you that, can, that you can find a harmony in just by the ontological conditioning of reality, where if you give metaphysical, metaphysics a shot, you might be able to find that harmony. And also too, if you're gonna discuss lacks, you kind of do have to discuss met metaphysics because you're talking about a form that is not there. And, it, and once you kind of get form and you get that indeed in the pile of debris, as Mr. Jocker discusses, there is some form of bridge missing then you start to see lacks everywhere. They start to really compose a massive component of your life. And it starts to become kind of ridiculous to suggest that metaphysics in this sense doesn't play a role. And that's again, why we try to make a point to say that not all metaphysics is the metaphysics, I call it the metaphysics of the book because I'm playing off the does on grammatology. Um, not all metaphysics is systems, these giant sort of systems, these metaphysics of apprehension are different in kind as we call them. And, um, and we have to take them seriously. And of course, all of it is also rests upon this distinction between um, perceiving and thinking, the act of seeing a cat cross the street and the act of thinking about a cat crossing the street. And I always make examples of cats for reasons that are deep and probably come from my childhood and I can't explain. Uh, but there is a difference between thinking about a cat crossing the street and watching a cat cross the street. For Derrida, he kind of deconstructs metaphysics on grounds of the word. You know, you see the signifier and the signified. And then he says, well, what is a uh, experience but a presence? But the experience of a cat crossing the street is not the same as the word cat on a piece of paper. These are different experiences. And considering that there are different experiences, we can't equally um, deconstruct them. Now, I'm not going to get into all that because that's in the treatise and hopefully it's elaborated even more on reconstructing ASA. But it's just so, so critical to, to understand that um, metaphysics did not end with Derrida. And if it is the case that metaphysics is necessary for understanding um, uh, forms that are that that are not present that you know they're not they're here but they're not here these sort of forms that we're describing describing uh, with Mr. Jockin. Um, well, if you think metaphysics is gone, then you have no lens, no way, no uh, framework by which to understand all of these phenomena, and that is practically consequential. And that and that, that's just the point I want to make before passing it passing it on is we we so often think metaphysics is not practical that it doesn't matter what your metaphysical conception is, that it, it's kind of silly. It's like, it's just something that some crazy academics do to you know, get tenure or something, right? No, 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 no. 
If you believe beauty is something you can, in a way, plug your lack into, your self-lack into this higher lack to find a certain harmony, then you are going to have a radically different orientation to life than someone who doesn't. Maybe you're crazy, maybe you're wrong, but the very fact, but there are still practical consequences just to think in that way, even if you're wrong in that way. Um, so, to, so to act as if metaphysics has no impact on how you live your life is, is very silly. And in fact, if you assume that, that of course is your metaphysical framework and thus you live your life. So I, that's the other thing that's just so critical is, to, is again, especially once you see the connection between metaphysics and phenomenology, it becomes practical. It really, really affects how, how you live your life. Um, and, and so hopefully, you know, if you really do believe you can glimpse beauty, like you were talking about, Michelle, like there are these moments that are worth capturing. Now, of course, if we follow Jock and when we come upon a pile that was once a bridge, that's not glimmering out of existence. But when we turn away from the pile, then it's not the same. So there, there's this glancing, uh, these glances of, of these phenomena. But if you get that, if you get that there are these moments where you can glance these, uh, these, different uh, metaphysical entities, then life gets a sort of excitement to it, doesn't it? It's like, uh, you, wanna, you wanna keep your eyes open. And that, that might help with uh, what Vernanke talks about as the meaning crisis. That is, is uh, something that seems to be plaguing us. Like symphony of converse. I mean, I wrote notes down just so I can keep track of what everyone said. Um, what about a lot of the ideas that I personally wanna explore more in the second, in the more, in the future renditions from this series, right? Um, I'll start from the back, from the back, which is, I mean, you want to talk about the implications of this and the importance of it or where it's not just ideas in the head. It completely changed my point of view of death. More significant than that kind of discussion or that kind of thinking. Um, when you treat death no longer as a no being, but as a lack, why is because there's an underlying subject every lack pre-presumes an underlying subject. So the point is that you can actually use, when you understand that, it's not the obliteration of the underlying subject, it's a change of contrary state. It changes the entire orientation. Now I come from a, a, a faith tradition. It really actually found, grounds it and actually makes per, it light, a little light in my eyes that I couldn't see before, to be honest. But that's so, in terms of the implications of this discussion, I think it, for me personally, it had a gigantic impact in my personal life. Um, and the point, you know, treating lacks is, you know, it's funny because I actually agree. Lack is such, the term lack as Aristotle used is equivocal. It had a lot of different sub meanings of it, incapacity, absence. It was a lot of different things. Um, it could be sub privation. It could mean different, it got turned into different definitions over time. Um, I think what we're doing here as a group, we're trying to circle back to that original understanding of it and it's rich in complexity um, and realizing there's a lot to uncover in the discovery of it. Because the biggest note is that I agree with Daniel in the saying that when you start thinking about lack as a, as a kind of mode of being, you forget about the abundance of existence, abundance of presence, there's an abundance of lack. In fact, if anything, the lacks are actually more. It actually causes this kind of, I don't know if anyone really, if you really think about it, it's kind of this, horrifying awe feeling of like the magnitude of every every second and everything that has existence is sitting with lack right next to it of a higher magnitude right with it every single time um and also there's the practicalities like you know it's funny like before i got into philosophy the reason why i got involved in philosophy and got interested in this whole question was because i came from a business point of view what motivates human behavior what motivates economic transactions? It was this movement of lack of fulfillment. That was the original account. It was very superficial and kind of general. It's, it's very, um, what we're talking here, but it's the basic mode. And it's a very useful mode. It's a very useful instrument in terms of discussing that domain. But then as you can tell, it has so many other implications, so many other aspects. So I just wanna build on those points Daniel was making about the practicalities or implications of this is and lacks in metaphysics in particular. Um, some, I mean, Javier said it specifically about the icon, the image, the exemplar, right? And the powers that was have used Jesus. Role models could be anyone and anything. Basic idea is that this mode of lack has this 
I was one of the essays I want to write about is this discussion of the modality of the icon of the exemplar cause. Usually in Aristotelian accounts, we get the four clauses, right? Efficient, final, formal, and material. Exemplar is used and discussed, is usually used in a, in a, in a Christian discussion. So Aquinas uses it, for example. Um, let me confuse where it goes. Is it, is it part of the final cause? Is it part of the formal? Is it efficient? Is it all three? The mix points to just strong cases that it, these, from, an, from a phonological point of view, it's going on here. And it's such a crazy thing because remember, the example or the idea that it's a, it's a particular one that points to an all. And that in participation of you with the one is reminding you of your gap to pointing to. It's, in, it's also in a way, um, from my point of view, it does end up in a theological conclusion because, right? Saying that something has to be the absolute, the, the perfection that's not lacking. And you generally just say that's what God is, right? Qualities of, of truth, goodness, and Or I'm just saying that these modes of conversation feel end up there in one way or the other. Um, but the other one too, and I, I will admit, this is actually a conundrum that I've been dealing with. I've been talking to this to everyone here privately about it, is, was when, Aqu when Aquinas ran into this, this, the term of lack that Rosal uses. He converted to be privation, and he used that account to explain the nature of evil. The good of existence. So literally no being, non-being. He this is where or one of the places it happened. It wasn't just Aquinas who did this, other Christian theologians also made this argument too. Um, but it's generally the privation accounts of evil, of being. And that no, a lax are not non-being, it's something else going on, but then we're left to what are we gonna do? Not accept evil that it doesn't exist. This is just a subjective opinion that doesn't matter in actual existence. There is no evil. I feel not compelled. I'm not willing to fall on that sword yet. Um, I do think it's worth, we have to re refine our, mod our discussion here to an account to explain this in some way. I do think this, this and actually, uh, and Michelle and Javi talked about it, this idea of the nature of indefiniteness at, you know, a deficiency moving towards its fulfillment necessarily is the fulfillment moving to, ex to excess. Usually, so for example, in virtue ethics, usually virtue is, there's a reason why Aristotle said virtue is the mean. There's a reason why he said that. I think this is one of the wisdoms of that, of that definition um, because a mean is supposed to be definite. It has a conclusion. There's a kind of a finality to it. And there's, as long as you're deficient, you're moving towards it. Yes, you're not there yet, but you have a kind of path forward. But there's a difference between, for example, being a coward and brave and being reckless. There's a difference. And the, the, account, I, the accounts I was saying is like, perhaps the way we can explain this is that lacks really, or in the movement of deficiency to fulfillment is a one mode. But then when that, when that fulfillment is a kind of indefinite class instead of a definite class. So for example, like, Pounds, and you're right. You, you keep you could keep losing pounds, two or three pounds, and actually, eventually, you'd be annihilating yourself because you have no weight anymore. You would no longer exist. Um, Money, another example of it, things that don't have any definiteness. But that's uh, these are like nuances in the argument or the account that I think are worth exploring. I don't have an answer yet. These are just me talking out loud. Um, these nature of these problems. From my. Um, I do, I do really appreciate what Michelle said about this kind of the, you know, the compelling, the call, answering the call that lacks do that to you, that when you're in this moment of witnessing and you, and kind of combine with Javier said, this idea that um, we're not avoiding, but do that. Basically, when you're kind of acknowledging you're aware of the deficiency in you, the lack in you, 
it's very easy to write it off, to rationalize, make a story, ways you can bounce it off so that you don't want to confront it, as opposed to kind of the bravery required to acknowledge a lack and take the steps necessary to pursue it, to say, I'm going to seek this out. I'm going to try to answer the call and versus ignoring the call. It's very Heideggerian. A lot of Heidegger, I'm feeling. I'm, in, I'm actually in the um, class for Heidegger right now, Heidegger in depth. Um, it's very compelling. It's very, I'm seeing a lot of analogies to that or connections to it. So I think it's a lot of power to it. Uh, this kind of procession of discussion. It's very much opposing. I feel, I do feel like it's, it's opposing him, right? So it's opposing of love, it's opposing of lack in this case. And yeah, no, very good. Thank you, Thomas. Um, <clears throat> a couple things, I guess I'll just take it from when you're talking about indefinite. Um, that term and that terminology, you know, it's inter interesting because I feel like um, if we don't accept the lack, the ontological lack, which we actually are, as you mentioned, Javier, if we, if we don't accept that, then when, when we do, when we embrace that, actually, and I, I just have this image of like, kind of like, just, just hug the void. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like when we I think when we embrace it uh we we do strangely kind of op open up ourselves to to the leaning in and like you're saying Tom said it's a lot of the the pressing in and, and not being not avoiding it but really keep continuing to push in hopefully if you push in far enough you'll like reach the suction cup and we'll drag you into beauty infinite beauty <laughs> but but basically like that that idea that the the indefinite see the thing is there's always going to be some indefinite if you don't, if you don't embrace the lack, okay, and you try to fulfill it, you know, with the lose the two two pounds, you know, or like get the nose job, get, if we're just talking about beauty, because that's where, you know, it's like, you know, now the next thing, like, now I'm going to dye my hair. I mean, then none of these things are wrong or bad in and of themselves. The problem is when you're constantly trying to fill the, you know, fill the lack, you know, close the gap, basically. Um, and, and you'll never, you'll never get there with those, with those things. So it's still indefinite. It's like, it's, it, it, there's, it's not, um, it's an insatiable, you know, desire to keep meeting this image, right? If we're talking about beauty. And that is, you know, like, like Javier said, the, the tyranny, well, did you say this language, tyranny of the image? But it's like, it made me think about that, like tyranny of the image. That makes it, it's in some ways, I feel like that does very much forget perception though, because the only way you can have an, like, even if you, to have an image of something is you have a judgment of it which had to be your thinking stepping in. And, and it's very important that we think that that's very unique to, to us as humans. But if we lose the perception, then it will become tyrannical. <laughs> it will be because we're not really allowing ourselves to be open to this perception, that, to the perception as well, which then I think loses our grip to, the, to an image of beauty. And now we can be open to beauty instead. And, and understand that there are going to be times you, you maybe feel beautiful, you don't feel beautiful, you look beautiful, you don't look beautiful. But it's like, there's always going to be some up and down. There's always going to be some sort of like, like I'm saying, the indefinite. But where do you want to feel? Like, where, where are you going to kind of go? What indefinite are you choosing? <laughs> you know, If you choose the indefinite of the, you know, the next thing and the next like, you know, nose job, boob job, hair done, done whatever, then, you know, you're going to be probably depleting all of your resources monetarily if we're honest and then also you're, you're you you've kind of lost a sense of who you know yourself in a way now if you can do those things with a very strong sense of of fulfillment and of yourself then then perhaps it could be possible to do that but if you're chasing the image you you, you will likely not be satisfied you will not because there's always going to be the next person who comes around the corner who just looks more beautiful that day. Like they just, they just looks, they look more beautiful. And you're like, dang, I'm so close. <laughs> I thought, thought, thought I was there. And it's, it's interesting. Cause often I think if you, if you're not trying to chase that tyranny of the image, I think that, I think that that's actually like in some ways, like I told Daniel this when we were talking about things on the porch, it's almost like the person with their harmonica and they're just like playing their little ditty and it's not, you know, it's not that great, but like they're trying and it's so great that they're like just putting themselves out there and, and you're like, I don't even care. Like, that's just so great. I love that. Like that was beautiful to me that you were willing to just be yourself 
and and be you know kind of confident just kind of be yourself and that's what I mean with like embracing the ontological black if, if you can just be be your and I know that's such a catchphrase like be you you do you and it's it gets kind of very it's not really really uh substantiated very much sometimes and I think that's difficult because then I don't think, think people know how to do you <laughs> you know they like they don't know what it means you know what does it mean like to be myself blah, blah. but if we can embrace the ontological lack I think that's the missing aspect of those uh, you know sure. iconographics or whatever means or you know it's like if you embrace that you know there is th th that's where I think there's going to be a lot of satisfaction in the end and it's it will still there'll still be something indefinite going on so you, you can never avoid that um but you're you're complete in your incompleteness you know there there's there's an there is a completeness in your incompleteness and it it there's a straight it's like an oscillation like two sides of the same coin to have incompleteness and completeness happening at the same time and i think that it 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 does really you know if we're talking about like if we're going back to the beauty and the image and that if you're if you're kind of like allowing yourself to say i'm not going to chase that um, instead, I'm going to be open to beauty, my own beauty, the beauty around me, um, the beauty that is greater than me, pushing into that, feeling uncomfortable sometimes. I think that's where you can kind of have an access and glimpses of that eternal beauty, you know, and, and, you know, if we're talking theologically God, you know, so it, it it's, um, I think that's, you know, just again, for me, like often when I, when I see it in, in the realm of beauty, it always makes, it makes a lot more sense for me. And so that's why often my points kind of go, go back to that. Um, so that's, that's what I'll, I'll share for now. I'll, I'll, I'll let, I'll let Javier take it away. Now, the, the first thing that came to my mind when you said, uh, like, be yourself, right? This is what I always love doing, the taking the common phrases and just making it more strange again because be yourself already implies a lack <laughs> i don't even know what that means be yourself you're saying you're ta you're talking about you want me to go back to what i was but what i was was already lacking and that's why i'm trying to be something else and so the so, so when someone says be yourself they're trying to say actually the, the lack previously was better Right, the lack that you're pursuing now is actually better than the it's it's worse. The lack that you're pursuing now is is creates a worse self of you because that's not the self that I like to see of you. So, to be yourself is to be the lack that you were previously, right, or or the lack that you were always were, um, you know, uh, to phrase it that way. And and I and I always find that interesting, you know, because you hear this uh, very often in, in dating, right. Well, you know, it's it's all right. You know, just just be yourself. <laughs> you know, if, if she likes you, she likes you. If she doesn't like you, you know, uh, you know. I, I guess you know there'll, there'll be some other gal out there. Um, and <laughs> but the the person is struggling with this, right? He wants to be, um, he wants to be the the lack that isn't, right? The he wants to be the lack for the other person. Right? So that's why he's avoiding being himself because he wants to be the lack for the other person. But that's what's very strange is, is that we often, we can't be each other's lacks. I think, that's, I think that's what's painful in the end is that we can't be each other's lacks. Um, and then so relating to each other is very hard because we think we can be each other's lacks. Right? And, and the idea is that we think mean uh, completion and and lack and and i wrote a paper about this previously about about love right and one of the lines that i wrote was to define love is to stop the conversation right and once you stop the conversation well you know it, it instantly becomes tyrannical about what we all think love is and the the purpose about not defining love is to be able to have the conversation. Um, and so I've, I've always done a series about dating, right? Like if you talk to people about cheating, there's many aspects of cheating that people disagree about. For, for cheating for another person, that's mental cheating, right? The moment you're texting another human being, that's cheating, right? <laughs> for them, that's cheating. But for maybe another person, it's a, a sexual engagement, right? And that's cheating. For them, that's a very clear cheating. 
And so all these definitions of cheating, whatever they are, um, what we're lacking is the conversation about, well, what do you think, what is cheating for you? And I'm gonna tell you what I think is cheating. And then we could just start talking and, and maybe we can come to an agreement or maybe not, but at least I can, at least what, I what we should do is put our lacks in front of us and, and, and begin to relate to one another. Um, now, there's something said about ob objectivity, right? I was, I've been thinking about this. And when Daniel said the no, it's, it's a, the self lack. Well, that's what kind of objectivity is, right? As long as we lack the self, we can make it objective. <laughs> and, and what's really interesting about the self is that the self has the capacity to make him, is always lacking in order to have the, uh, to make objectivity, um, to, I guess, use a psychoanalytic term, uh, dissociate, right? It's a weird capacity to dissociate and be like, I'm not involved in this. This is all objective, right? I'm not putting my, I'm not interjecting my own subjective things, which is always intriguing me that we can do this, that we have the capacity to do this, right? That the, that we can be a self and a, a, a lack of self with the capacity to make something objective and avoiding ourselves in, at the same process, right? Doing our best at least to attempt to avoid ourselves being tangled in with the process. So we, we can make it objective. Um, I've always found that intriguing when we, when we talk about object, you know, is this objective or is this too subjective? Like, is there just too much self going on in here? <laughs> or is this not enough? Um, and uh, th those were just my thoughts uh, on what I was thinking about. And to answer Thomas's, I was thinking about good and evil. And there's something about good and evil that Ibn Arabi said, um, where, it is, it is common to actually identify evil as non-being, right? And, and as goodness would be being, right? But then I thought about if as human beings, we were the ontological gap, right? This would actually say that we are capable of being good and capable of doing evil. So be, to be in between the being and the non-being, um, shows capacity that we can do good and we can be non-being. So we can fluctuate between being and non-being. Um, and, and that means we're always sort of lacking uh, both. <laughs> you know, we're never quite fully good. We're never quite fully evil, even though there's people more evil than others and so on. Um, but then, then there's also, I, I started thinking about, there's also that, Ironically enough, because you are in the, the gap, if we take what, I, what I'm saying as uh, any uh, sense of credibility, <laughs> if we just entertain it, uh, there is also that sense of lack itself can be beyond good and evil because it's, it's in between it. And we never, we never look at the in-between as actually this in-between could be beyond it itself. Um, which is interesting uh, <laughs> when I think about it. Um, and then I was thinking about that first philosopher. What, what was his name? The, the one that came up with the, the, the one being, can you say it, Daniel? Un unmute, can you unmute? Oh, Parmenides. Yeah, Parmenides. okay. Parmen Parmenides, okay, yes. I, I'm not sure if I did a horrible misreading, but if my horrible misreading helps us get somewhere, it might, it might. Uh, there's something about, we talked about indefiniteness, right? Um, the reading that I got from Parmenides was this. He says that, that the being itself is um, not, it's finite, not infinite, but finite. And I always found that very interesting because we always look at each other as finite beings. But for Parmenides, if again, if I'm reading this the way I read it, <laughs> <laughs> finite was actually completeness but 
we don't look at finite as being complete anymore. And I, and I thought that reading that I did was interesting because we always talk about infinity, but infinity always lacks uh, finite. <laughs> and, but, but then the way, uh, at least the way Parmenides framed it, was like, well, finite is the only complete thing because it doesn't need it's not lacking. It doesn't need to be infinite because that means it's lacking something. And so actually it changed my mind about how we view ourselves as human beings when I, when I began to read it. Cause I was like, why is it that we always want to live forever? You know, <laughs> you know? And, it, and it's always this, this idea about, you know, maybe, maybe it's just the opposite. Maybe we are, uh, you know, infinite beings. And the one thing that we're lacking is, uh, uh, you know, to be finite. But then that co the question of death comes into the picture, of course. Um, and, and, and that's always the most intriguing part. And, and that's what I'm always fascinated about. And I don't have not much to say about that because <laughs> I don't know, but um, there is something to say uh, I wanted to go back, like way back, about the bridge. When we talked about the rubble and there had been previously a bridge, and I was imagining myself like looking at the rubble, and then someone saying, um, "Could you imagine there being a bridge?" And I and I thought, "Well, yeah, yeah, I could, I could." And then all of a sudden, by him just saying that. It's, all, it's already lacking, right? Because I can already imagine there being a bridge. And I think oftentimes we don't, we don't, it's, it's all about the way we describe things and the way we talk about things because the way we talk about things can really impact the way we live. And if, if someone, if I just looked at the rubble and no one ever said anything to me, I wouldn't think twice about that I would just walk away and be like, oh, they destroyed something there. But, uh, you know, oh, you know, whatever that was, that's, you know, it's not there anymore. Or, you know, or maybe it was always rubble, who knows? But um, I'm not entertaining it. But when someone says, could you imagine there being a bridge? Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I could. Um, and I always find that interesting because it's, there's something about lack that we can always imagine. It, it, it's, it, it's what makes good fiction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's what makes good fi fiction to talk about you guys' paper, uh, which I love so much. And, and I think this is why I'm so interested in psychoanalysis, because, you know, Freud talks about how biographies are more fiction than anything else. And, and the reason why he says that biographies are more fiction than anything else is because we as human beings always try to fill that gap of things that just don't make sense. And, and memory itself functions like that. When we study dreams, Freud found that we have a tendency to try to link images that we found in the dream and make sense of the story. And the moment we try to fill those gaps, we've created a fiction. And we do this all the time to ourselves. And um, there's something that Artie Lang said today on YouTube that really hit me. <laughs> He said, is it worse to lie or to live in a lie? <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> but uh, I'll leave, I'll leave that there. No, no, that's excellent. And, uh, you know, the difference between uh, being yourself as a, um, a uh, primordial unity resulting from autonomous rationality in a dialectical paradox that's trying to manage contradiction. You know, if you're saying be yourself as in kind of the Freudian dream of the primordial unified being, that's a problem. But if by be yourself, there's something about you actually are indivisible from some sort of lack ontologically and you need to be that. Well, that's that's quite different. So the, the meaning of the phrase is, is huge. Um, it's also very interesting, you know, the word infinity, you know, not finite, non-existence. There's also kind of an idea that um, 
if God doesn't make uh, creation, then there's no completeness. There's just God that is sort of infinite by, by making both, there's a completeness that can move. Because if you have completeness, but no relation with infinity, then it's complete and dead because it's done, it's finished. So it's kind of interesting theologically, there's always that debate about did God have to create? Did God need to be, you know, this kind of half and all of that, that language that's, or is it God in his essence, it kind of poured out of him. And it leads into this interesting like thinking of the idea that it, the finite and the infinite have to have a relation because if there's just the infinite, then there's no, it's movement perhaps, expansion, but no completeness. But if there's just finite, there's no, there's no movement, it's sort of done. And I think this also leads um, into the interesting thinking of Democritus that we were with Cadell in them recently, uh, Tim and uh, Ebert, on the idea that in Democritus, atoms and void, pre-Socratic thinker, there's this idea that the only re reason atoms can move is because there is void. There is space. If there's no space, then atoms can't move. And if they can't move, then nothing can formulate and there's nothing. And it's really important for Democritus that void is not nothing, that it is, uh, it's a, it has, it's a background that makes um, being possible, that once you get rid of it, you, uh, you can't move anymore. Nothing can come together. And what's really interesting, if we take everything we're saying and we go, okay, lack is actually primary to human existence, that it more so than even being, then suddenly, um, uh, there, there is a real sense in which there's some sort of background of lack and that's why we move. Because if you think about it, think about if you literally didn't lack anything, you had all the money, you had all the A, B, C, D, F, G, what would you get out of bed for, right? You'd be complete, you know, what would you do? There's something about lack and maybe that's why you have a meaning crisis because people have cut off the possibility of there being a higher dimension of something that they're lacking that you glimpse in beauty and maybe that does lead to God. So they've cut that out. So then there's only, I guess, finite lacks, lacks you can actually fulfill. Then once you do it, it's, it's over and you're bored. And what is boredom? Boredom is not, we talk about this all the time, boredom is not a state where you have nothing to do because there's always something you could do. It's a state where, you've, where you stop seeing significance in what you could do. It is where you stop seeing significance of what you could do. And if you have a crisis of boredom, then you have a crisis of people feeling complete <laughs> where there is no lack. And if interesting enough, when you make being primary, you know, in your thinking, as opposed to lack, if I say to you that you are a being, it doesn't really tell you much, right? It's like, okay, I'll, I guess I'll just be. But if I say to you, you are a lack, oh, well, I better get going. <laughs> like there's something to do. There's something I need to do. So there's something too, where if I say, it's just a much more beautiful conception of life. But this is the funny thing. The beauty of this conception of life comes from an acceptance of lack which since our only conception of lack is as nothing, is your headphone still working or I kick it out of your ear? Okay, so we're wearing both everyone. Um, so if lack is nothing, then lack is nothing. And nihilist, th then the only way you can relate to lack is negatively. I mean, imagine a world where lack is an indication of a calling, of a movement, well, then maybe a nihilist would be a positive thing if you consider nothing as a lack, right? But since you don't have that category, all thinking of nothing must be bad. But if I say, but isn't it funny? Um, because, because I say, okay, the world is, it's, it's out there, it has being, you have being, well, there's, I don't know what to do. But if I say to you, you're lacking, you know it in your very, the way your mind works. Oh, and by the way, pay attention to those experiences where it feels like there's something more to world, that you're having an incomplete, like you're glimpsing the top of a glacier. Like when you see, a, I keep using the beautiful sunset example. You see that and it feels like there's something more to life than that. There's something, the top of the glacier. Huh. So that makes you feel like there's something more to life. You feel like you're lacking something. Suddenly life has this movement. There's this push. There's this mystery to be solved. There's something bigger. There's something more out there, right? But if I just say you have being, Yeah, you know, just like that, right? It's crap hands. hands. It's crap hands. You sit in your living room and you do crap hands all day. Um, so what's so interesting is that the emphasis on lack, both self-lack, ontological lack, object lack, different things like that, um, completely transform. It gives life movement. It, it, you don't have this problem. Yeah, if everything is being, you have completeness. But completeness could have a stagnancy. And that's why, because I think you're right, finite is the, the only things completable are finite. But that would mean the only things that can die and stop moving are also finite. So then it becomes a dialectical relationship between the finite and the infinite, the thinking and the perceiving. Everything comes to be dialectical, you know, a movement of back and forth, a movement of back and forth where you can never stop. So by bringing lack in, we've made this infinite movement, this sort of movement, this paying attention, this going back. So, so boredom gets out of the... Um, 
gets out of the uh, the equation. And um, you know, I, I'm extremely uh, you know tempted to get into this wonderful conversation on privation versus lack. <laughs> I want to say things about is a privation where you have you know you have the capability of being courageous, but you're not. Where lack is, you don't have the capability to be courageous, so you're lacking. Where you have to maybe maybe you have the ability to begin getting courageous, so you're it's evil in so much as you didn't take those steps that you could have taken, but it's only a lack and not evil in the sense because you know on level five courage or something. So you're responsible for level one courage that you didn't get, but not level five. It would be interesting to follow that gradient. I think it's a fantastic question that I will leave to uh, you and your expertise, Mr. Jockin, to pursue. The, uh, the thing that, uh, and I'll scribble out some more sticky notes uh, that will be useless to you because they're on this side of the Zoom camera. But anyway, the thing I was going to say is other, on the point of imagination, if in fact lack is primary, and if in fact the only way, and, and, and um, if by definition lack must be imagined, then imagination becomes a big deal all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. It's not just about um, observation. Uh, and if imagination is a big deal, suddenly, I don't know, maybe the humanities matter or something, you know, these abilities to cultivate imagination, these abilities to see the lack. Um, also, also too, too, so imagination suddenly matters. Um, and if indeed we are primarily lacking and you can only know that lack or even know what to do with it via imagination, because by definition, it cannot be observed, then this meaning crisis we're going through um, that we seem to want to solve by getting rid of imagination or to de-emphasize imagination, or it's not really a big thing that we talk about. I mean, if you're free time, you want to read some Dostoevsky, that's nice, but we don't view it as having... Um, we don't see imagination as having any sort of mental health benefit. We certainly don't see it as helping you get to truer reality, but if indeed lack is primary, then the only way to truer reality has something to do with imagination. And we also, if indeed, oh, and the last thing I was gonna say, if lack is primary, then you don't, to say what you were saying on relationships, then you don't go into relationships expecting there not to be lack. You instead go into a relationship saying, how do we live with this lack? How do we use this lack in a manner not to get rid of it, to but to propel us dialectically to doing better, to becoming better people going forward? Because the, the trick is that just because there's an infinite dialectic does not mean there is not progress. You know, a lot of people say, oh, if it's infinite, there's no progress. No, 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 no. Being this far in infinity is better, you know, is, uh, is better than being this far in infinity or this far, or this far. There is, in fact, progress, but you're not going to make that progress if you don't think dialectics and lack are a necessary point of the, um, of, of the equation. In fact, if you go into dating, you're just going to be looking for the person who has the most being who doesn't have any lack. And of course, since that doesn't exist, that means everyone has to go into dating lying or faking or being a, self, a false self. And then, we, and then people wonder why there's so much, there's so much trouble. So to close, I, I, I think um, I said close four times. You see, this is like where they do the encore in a symphony orchestra where people keep talking, you know, they clap and he comes back on the stage, blah, blah. Um, if, if lack is primary, then actually metaphysics, imagination, et cetera, is more primary than physics, right? If being is all there is, then the name of the game is to observe being, to see being, to look at being, to, to the physical. And if in fact lax is primary, then metaphysics is what matters to us. And this gets into what I would call more so to us. This gets into the distinction between explain and address. Um, I can explain to you how you were born, Havera, you know, Javier. I can explain to you how, you how you got there, how you exist. But will you feel like I addressed you? If I say, oh, you're there because you were born and you were in this state and that, and I could explain to you, right? If I were to um, explain, there's a meteor coming toward planet Earth and I were to explain to you why it's coming toward planet Earth. Oh, it came out of the asteroid belt. It had this trajectory. And they said, okay, but it's heading toward planet Earth. How are you going to address that? <laughs> you know, you've explained it, but now we need to address it. We live in an age where in getting rid of metaphysics, we feel like we address problems by explaining them. Oh, well, you feel like you're lacking because you know you don't have the money, or you have this chemical imbalance, blah, blah, blah. And we explain why you have them. And we think, oh, that now they've been addressed. But no, they have not been addressed. They've only been explained. And certainly explaining can help you learn how to address. But without metaphys, if indeed human beings are primarily lacking, and that can only be known by imagination, then the only way human beings ever feel addressed fully is going to involve an imaginative act that gets integrated with philosophy, that gets integrated with rationality. If we do not do that, then we're going to have a lot of human people on this planet who feel like their lives have been explained, but their lives have not been addressed. 
And so that's another reason why I think metaphysics is so, so important. It's very powerful, Daniel. There's one objection on this whole thing, on the question of imagination. Um, it's not credit. I, get, I say we, this goes a noose. This is not imagination. This is noose. I mean, intentional awareness of the thing in front of you. Because uh, basically, it's, it's using Aristotelian accounts to explain how when we see the, uh, like the substance in front of us, mm -hmm. possibly doing this. The only way, the way they make the account is noose, understanding, like that kind of, uh, this is in front of me kind of effect. Um, I bring that up because lacks are very much in that mode. That's basically what I would argue, I would write an argument. I think, I don't disagree that this, it has modes of hypothetical discourse in terms of imaginative. Imagine this, imagine the bridge there. I don't disagree with that. I just think we could go even further. Because we can say also, could you imagine a triangle? Yes, you could too. <laughs> that's, that's that's the essence existence distinction, right? That kind of point. Oh, um, sure. And when I, and when I say imagination, you know, I don't necessarily mean creative imagination, but the ability to see in A B, the ability to see something alternative. And arguably, the point you're making is that I guess if we combine the points, is that you can't have understanding without that ability to see B and A to overlay. Let's look at it that way: the ability to overlay. Um, different thoughts. Uh, because there is a, I think you're correct, there is a danger when I use the term imagination, that people hear that and immediately associate it with creative production, as opposed to um, seeing it in terms of the overlay of A with B to get fuller understanding. So that's a fair point. Having conversations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That said, just without that one caveat, I mean, again, your points about the, the value of the of the humanities, right? Is that, you know, values matter, right? Because reality, our assessments of reality and what's lacking is, it is, there's a different, there's a whole other domain of discussion. You know, generally I'm mean, kind of like hesitant to deal with this question because normally this is where the problem of private, the critique of privation is this, is that it's a subjective or not that never said it's a cultural no, um, no that you're blind is a privation it's because we expect it to have people have on have sight um expectation versus uh what we're what everyone's doing here we're saying that's not that's not enough that's not you're doing that's a right if you do that you're really saying you're missing a lot from the conversation i'm kind of hesitant to discuss that framing of it but i do think it's a very important out of it i think the part of the humanities is to is to, to uh, confront and address, there you go. Not just to explain, but address our values and our principles and our how we want to our ways of being, basically. I think um, you know, way back in the circle with Michelle, I mean, this whole thing about beauty, right? This whole distinction between the plastic surgery run, changing everything about you in a physical domain, and in one sense is where we that those virus mulfier cases come in where the person was one way and then they went through so many surgeries and all this stuff and they look like cartoon characters, they have this, the form, they're like um, malanged bodies basically uh, at the end. Um, let's contrast that to like, like because that's, you can the argument that's a, a over emphasis of beauty on that physical domain. Counts that well, the beautiful act, virtues, right? Act, which can point to exemplars, right? Those, you also can with beautiful people as well, right? Beautiful figures, models all that, but people ask, you can likely just point to role models and it's have the same potential excess destruction. Probably could, to be honest. Like you say, you have a model and you're gonna follow it and then you take it way too extreme. Um, doubt that I think, you think um, also in beauty, it's not just, beautiful is not just the aesthetic in terms of physical things, but also the aesthetic of ways of being. What about this idea of playing an instrument? That's kind of all, like this idea of like authenticity. What is authenticity? 
Well, the dizzy might be this position orientation of yourself of acknowledging your lack. Like this is, this is what I am. I'm not in resistance. I'm not like hiding it. I'm not obscuring it. I'm not trying to like, I'm not like in my way about it. I just, here I am. And that kind of pure self-esteem confidence of this is what I am in my lack and in my existence and together. Actually, it's actually is my existence, to be honest. It's really the presence and lack all together. Uh, or the lack is the present or whatever. This is where this is where language is falling apart. I don't we don't have a language that really hits this note that effectively. But I think I think a Michelle's point about playing an instrument beautifully, um perfectly beautifully, right? Because it's self it's with a certain self-respect and a self-esteem. That's an authentic existence. Um and Javier's comments about how this interacts with interpersonal dynamics is right on the money running the relationships thinking that everyone's perfect <laughs> that you're and even worse that you're actually in stories in your head and then it becomes like this schema in your head of a story you're interacting with each other and then actually what happens is the accumulation of all the of the gap between the narrative in your head reality in front of you and that gap actually accumulates into a complete explosion eventually in the end so relationship to each other where you're confront you're addressing you're in relation to that lack. It's not a, you're kind of like obscuring it from this narrative, this, this little schema in your head of a story where it ought to be. If I Javier on that. Also a devastating comment from, from Freud, right? The biographies are nothing but fiction, brutal. And the, and the, because even what, the very act of what stories or what events get put into the biography and what acts or act, what, what events are being put into the foreground of a biography versus everything that hits them in, into the app, into the abyss of no being biography in the first. Hour in and it's an hour and a half, and I'm definitely running a little bit out of steam at this point. But I, I also just want to know, just um, you know, again, this whole discussion. But I actually, I had my notes up because tyranny of the image. It's a great story. It's a great framing by Javier and Michelle. Kind of built in this point with the the definite march where this could basically be thinking. And it both works both ways. I think in one sense, when it's a mode of indefiniteness that can destroy you. Right, I do think the idea of, of evil being not false existence, I think it's very valid, right? It's the aim of things that can destroy you, it can obliterate you. Um, and I think things that is a good definitional mode of what evil is and imagery that are false. Uh, we get this is a compelling to a beautiful, an image that's beautiful to us made more actual by, I think it's very powerful. Uh, the connection, right, this authenticity. Uh, this, it's my contribution this round just to talk about what the nature of our authenticity is at this point. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, I, um, I was thinking about that actually, like the idea of that. You know, the humanities of the arts are something important to value. Uh, at the same time, though, we can also like, you know, ascribe to certain narratives that aren't correct either, you know? So we're always kind of, we're always ascribing to some sort of story. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, when, I think we have to be, let's see if we get to, 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 to kind of get into the, the, the meat of this treatise with, you know, phenomenology being very important. I think the story that is always kind of re being reassessed, you know, when you're, when you're able to kind of keep the story reassessing, I think that's, that can be helpful because you're not trying to like overfit your story or, you know, as Daniel will say, sometimes like top down, like you're not pouring from the top exactly. You're like allowing it to build from mm -hmm. like, which actually makes me think a little bit off topic, but it has to do with dating kind of like this idea about, um, you know, Javier, you've been talking a lot lately about like, um, what does it mean if you say, I, I, I don't love you or, you know, this idea of love, falling in love. 
and I was actually thinking about how, um, you know, while, while there's a desire to, to fall in love, it's also, um, you know, it's a, it's a bang and a crash, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of poured in from the top, you know, you're kind of like, <laughs> you know, I just have this idea of like, there's something, of course, wonderful about that, but there's also something that the problematic aspect of the falling in love is the fact that it is, it, it, it tends to have the question of is, will it be sustained? <laughs> is, is, is there? Um, whereas I, I almost wish we used a language of like climbing in love or like ascending in love, you know, it's not poured in from the top. It's, it's being filled up over, over time. Um, so that's a random, random aside on that. But, but I, I did want to bring up something because two things really quick. The, the, one of the things I really appreciated, you know, Thomas, you're saying like something that really, for you, this project really, you know, for you personally really made a difference. For me personally, the thing that made a big difference, there are lots of things that I took away from it that were very meaningful for me personally. But I really did appreciate the idea of being able to say the way things are themselves we, we cannot dismiss that, that there is something that we must value in the way things are, you know, and I always think about the body, what is the body, like, telling us, showing us, and all the imagery of the body, and I, and sort of, maybe it's, maybe it's just sort of, like, selfish, but I was kind of like, woohoo, I can keep doing my, like, body imagery stuff, and make meaning out of it, and symbolism from the body, but, uh, uh, so, I'll just keep doing body. it, I mean, I was going to, do it anyways <laughs> but now I feel like maybe I'm like there's more like philosophical you know groundwork for doing it um but I was thinking about lack and and you know when we talk when Daniel you're saying about like the lack being primary it made me think a lot about the womb honestly mm -hmm. that symbol and it's it's a lack that starts when you when you cannot bear it when you're doing the leaning in and the pressing in you know when it ha is actually like full then, you know, it's funny because life happens when the lack returns, when you push the baby out. I'm just thinking about pregnancy and gestation. And it's just interesting that it's actually like a return to the lack that then the new life is, is born, you know? And, and to me, there's just something really, really profound about that. It's like the idea of the, it's, it, the start is the, is the lack. And then there's, there's, a, there's a constant lack fill lack fill but you were you you know it's it's kind of like you press in this idea of the the, the leaning in like we we're talking about when i was talking about the, the suction concept but it's like there's there's the, that final like it's it can feel very unbearable i think that's why people don't want to do the you know uh, pushing into the void really you know pushing into the lack um because it's it's quite um painful <laughs> you know it's uncomfortable but in, in just when you feel like you can't bear it at all, that's when the life is born, you know? Mm. And, um, and it's interesting, I think, honestly, like to, to kind of extend this analogy a little bit more, the child is born, okay? And I think something that I appreciate so much about developing a, a, a philosophy of glimpses is that it, I think it does really allow, you know, maybe this is the idea, but it, it allows the inner child to really be, born and you know what I mean we can we can really reinvigorate a sense of wonder I think um when we when we really embrace this philosophy of glimpses and so that that can push that analogy a little bit further there um goodness gracious oh yes but I did want to also say that it's funny when you're talking about like the meaning crisis and whatnot that it's like it's weird we do we do seem to have like a crisis of fullness actually you know and you know, it's also like, you know, you can get anything, you know, for the most part, largely, it's, it's odd that, that when you can, you know, whatever, you can watch whatever show you'd like, and basically get food whenever you really want, or, you know, get water whenever you want, it's, it's, there's so much actually, and it's weird, it would, you would think it would be reversed, but it's actually in yeah. the, the fullness and the, the, you know, all of this kind of like, abundance that that people often feel, you know, Maybe it's like their lack gets bigger. I don't know. It's like, it's almost like there's all this abundance out there. So then their lack's like, I have to match it. And so like that lack, you know, I don't know. There's something there, but I think that it, it, it people feel the lack more and, but, but are yet are not as willing to embrace it. So it's, it's not really like a, you know, I think we can all, I think the, 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 
perspective of gratitude for abundance. I'm not trying to, you know, I think we can all say it's, it's a very much a, a blessing to be able to get water, drink water whenever you want to. But, but the point is, it's just that it's, it is interesting that, you know, one sometimes starts to feel the lack almost more so um, in those, in those places and in this crisis of the fullness in a sense. Um, so it's like, I don't know, again, back to the bloom, it's like embrace the fact that there's the emptiness you know embrace the fact that there's the emptiness because you know th this is an oscillation this is life there will be it will be empty it will be full it will be empty again it will be full it will be empty again and I remember thinking like with with our first child I was like oh I, I'm, I'm sad in a way because the child is so near to me so near you know now they will be born and they will be apart from me in, in I mean not really they'll still you know be very close especially in their infancy but the, it, it was more symbolically that they will be a part and then they will go on to live their own lives as they grow grow up. But it's like, but then they won't be alive. They must be born. <laughs> right. You know, they must, otherwise they wouldn't survive. They wouldn't live if they're not born. So anyways, I just wanted to bring in that, that a little bit. Um, so thank you. Uh, Michelle, when you said um, they, that people try to match the lack I just, I couldn't help but think about capitalism. <laughs> I mean, it's, and you talk about like, for example, uh, the, immediately I started thinking about a child that wants to be a certain celebrity, right? And when he, when he, when he talked to him about becoming that celebrity, he's like, well, I hope that when I'm a celebrity, I'm going to have just as many cars as he has, if not more, um, uh, just as many, or, or maybe I can be Jeff Bezos and just go to the sky, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, we always want to match um, that and more. And it always, uh, there's, a, there's a book by Adam Phillips that has uh, just fried my brain because of everything that he provokes in it. Um, it's, it's all about unforbidden pleasures. And I thought this was interesting to bring up and how this could relate to lack because the main argument of this book is that Adam Phillips reframes unforbidden pleasures. He talks about how forbidden pleasures gain our attraction and create some kind of hierarchical experience where we no longer see the unforbidden as something that is still enjoyable, that we still rather do or entertain the idea of doing the unforbidden, I mean, the forbidden pleasure. And, and, what, he's, and what he's saying is, why is it that we're doing this? Um, why don't we, is it possible that when we're being forbidden something, that, this, that we're being taken away from something that is already there, um, something that we could still enjoy? Uh, and, and this aspect of unforbidden pleasures, it, it just really enticed me because what Adam Phillips is still provoking is that we can still enjoy each other. And this is the most unforbidden pleasure is that our capacity of being able to enjoy and relate to one another. And, and that for me, that was probably one of the most powerful arguments about unforbidden pleasures and how sometimes morality itself is so intimidating. And the moment you forbid something, you, you, in some sense, we, we get so distracted by the forbidding that we want to do it. And that's what makes it difficult to pay attention to the unforbidden pleasures. And so, and, but the thing that also Adam Phillips provokes, he goes, but because we're always forbidding something, we never entertain what could be, what is really possible for the unforbidden because we're always so distracted by the forbidden. Um, now he says, of course, there's, there are things that should be forbidden, but what, uh, there's a quote that he shares um, that I just love. He says, here's something about the good. He's like, the good is something that should always be argued about. And it's the fact that we can argue about the good that we can attempt to discover what is, um, good about the unforbidden what 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 we're not seeing and that's why the conversation should never stop um 
And that's why he's against this idea of, you know, tyranny of the image, like, of like what, I, what I said before, is because the tyranny of the image forbids you from seeing something. Why is it that we judge something rather than try to see what we're being prevented? Um, and, and, and what is it that it's distracting us from? Because a tyrant is always hiding something from us. What is that hiding? And these are just some of the thoughts that have uh, you know, infested my mind because I, I think when we wanna talk about black and everything, I think we've made black forbidden. That's what we've done. And it's the most distracting thing. Um, and yet we don't, we don't want to acknowledge or look at the unforbidden. And the thing is, arguing about the good is talking about this. And what we could do is make the lack unforbidden by talking about it, by addressing that the lack doesn't need to be forbidden, but something else could be forbidden instead, maybe. But it's that's the whole point, that we should argue about it, that we should talk about it. Um, because there is something possibly pleasurable about the unforbidden that doesn't need to be placed in some kind of hierarchical comparison where, you know, and, and the funny thing is like growing up as a Christian, right? <laughs> I always thought that the forbidden was more pleasurable than the unforbidden. But when I thought about this, really, after reading the book, when I really thought about it, I said, I never actually thought about it. <laughs> it just, because I was forbidden, it, it, it always entertained my obsession about it. Uh, it. I circled my life around it, right? I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. But I want to do it. But I want to do it. I shouldn't do it. But I'm never thinking about what could be. All the things that are right there, right next to me. And, uh, you know, again, that's why Adam Phillips has completely fascinated because, because his writing is more provocative than, and, and, and very philosophical as well, but it's, it's so provocative that it, it just left me in this state of, I'm really, I need to re reframe and redescribe my, my positioning and reality here because if I'm always pointing myself to, towards forbidden things and circling my life around forbidden things, um, there is something deeply pleasurable that I could be missing out on that is already there. And, and I thought that had a really deep theological um, implication as well, because the, the, the one thing that I remember being, you know, just involved in any faith, um, I remember someone would say, it, the pork question was always a good one. The pork question was always a good one, right? Why are you not allowed to eat pork? And it obsesses everybody. <laughs> you know, they're like, it doesn't make any sense. Why are you not allowed to eat pork? Um, and, <laughs> and, but it just proves Adam Phillips' point even further. It becomes an obsessive thing. I shouldn't eat pork. Why are you not allowed to eat pork? But we don't think about all the other things that we can eat that are just as pleasurable as pork. Why is it that pork is a more pleasurable experience than other things that are unforbidden? Why is it that we're always guided our attention that way rather than the other way? And, and so I, I just bacon. thought- It's <laughs> <laughs> bacon. It's bacon, obvious. <laughs> Come on, yeah, this is not the lottery, it's bacon. <laughs> no, more pleasurable than bacon. <laughs> bacon. I know, I know, so exactly. We should argue about this good. Yes. <laughs> it's bacon. It's bacon. The funny thing is, I know people would disagree, right? Like, obviously, bacon is better, and I don't want to have a conversation about it, but that's the thing, right? We should argue about it. We can. <laughs> a point. I mean, sorry to break the format, but we, as a fellow Muslim, I'm like, really? We're gonna play that game? If, oh, you're, wow. if, if you're in the account, if you're gonna buy into our account, you think eternal existence, your afterlife, 
is more like that's not as important as eating bacon. Just saying. I mean, that's just, that's just another example. I see, uh, that's a fellow lost in our general. total depravity, giving into the temptation of of bacon. Well, I can't even eat it because alpha gal. So you know, I've got holiness thanks to a tick. Uh, so that works out. So it works out. Um, but you know, on what Javier is saying, uh, there's this great book. Um, and uh, you know, to bring it together, because it's just been wonderful speaking with you fine gentlemen, and, and please interrupt as I'm talking, anything else you'd like to say just to, and I mean, part of the point of this is in fact to show that hopefully this treatise will open up you know, a lot of conversation on a lot of topics, like you're saying the difference between privation and, uh, and, uh, and lack, you know, how it seems that Aquinas kind of blurs those together to deal with evil, you know, that's a big, big topic. Javier, everything you're talking about relationships, you know, thinking about relationships in terms, terms of integrating lack as opposed to self-deception and denying lack, all of these are extremely important um, topics. And what's critical is that the topic of lacks seems to bring together the psychoanalytical and the ontological. There is some sort of bringing together of these two subjects that is really, really interesting, where you can't talk about one without ending up on the other. And, you know, in my head, you know, I have these, um, if I use the term completeness and associate it with uh, being. So there's four possibilities, which is always dangerous to say, but go with me. So you have the possibility that um, humans are complete and reality is complete. The possibility that humans are complete, but reality is incomplete. The possibility that humans are incomplete, but reality is complete. Or the possibility that humans are uh, incomplete and reality is incomplete. Okay, so you got four possibilities. Well, we all want to believe that they're both complete, right? So then we, so then lack becomes uh, forbidden. You can't mention it because that's going to screw up the possibility of harmony. And then we need being to be complete. So we need to get rid of metaphysics and have positivism, pure empiricism. We need to get rid of all that because those things aren't really found very readily in being in an objective sense. And so then of course, going back to what you were saying earlier, Javier, there's temptation to bracket out the subjective and say, I am objective in the sense of there's a distinction between saying I'm objective as in I am like an object as opposed to having an objective reason to believe there is lack in a bridge. There's a difference between those terms. And there is something about denial of subjectivity is that's trying to make you like an object. So that's very problematic. But if you're trying to get a harmony of being in, in ter, um, people, human completeness and uh, world completeness, then, you're, then that's what we've ended up with. The next one is where we say human beings are um, complete and the world is incomplete. Some people fall into that, but then you have to deny your lack, right? You have to find the right boyfriend, the girl, but you can't have it an eternal lack like you're describing. You have to deny those things. Um, what, and then the next one, of course, is where you say that, um, and then you say the world's lack. And what happens if you take that? You say, yeah, it's lacking, but you don't really actually kind of believe it. It's kind of strange to have a conception of there being like an ontological lack in the world. It tends to just be a scientific lack where you just got to go to Mars and discover more, right? That's how it kind of manifests. Um, you, you know, to, to cut to the point, if we really take seriously the idea, the only way to get a, a possibility of a harmony between humans and the world is by seeing both as lacking, as humans lacking and the world lacking. The, what the world is lacking is seemingly this completeness of reality that we can glimpse and that is alluded to. And we're lacking because we, of all the things we've discussed in psychoanalysis. Um, and so a reason why this project can be important is because for so long we've tried those other three options to sort of get a harmony between ourselves and the world and other people and what we're doing. And we haven't really tried, uh, I don't think we've really tried, accepting that there is something about um, humans that is inevitably lacking and inescapably lacking. But again, just because it's inescapably lacking can be precisely why you can move and you can advance and you can do better and you can get better through dialectical. And then simultaneously to say that there's reason to think that there's something out in the world um, that you can catch glimmers of, you know, who has seen the wind, neither I nor you, but when the leaves uh, stand trembling, the wind is passing through. That was the um, image we ended the treatise on. These moments that catch something, oh, there's moments of real love or where two people flow or you're doing music and you really jazz, you like go together, these moments of these harmonies. The hope is by seeing the possibility of a harmony between how we are inside is lacking and as the world is an incomplete, that would increase those experiences of harmony in that incompleteness, as Michelle was saying, that it would, in that incompleteness, you would see it as what makes movement possible, as what makes wonder possible. If you weren't lacking anything, what would you find wonder in? There would be nothing greater than you. There would be nothing more outstanding than you. It would, hard to, it would be hard to imagine a life of wonder 
if there was um, if there wasn't any lack. And so to close, I think I hope people hear this and in, 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 in take it as an invitation to a kind of quest, as a kind of journey, as a kind of incentive to go out and to, to, to see life as wonderful again, as to see it as having some sort of mystery that the more you find out about, the deeper you can go. Because right now, exactly what you said, Javier, the only quest people seem to live is a tearing down of the forbidden. It's uh, what Philip Reef talked about, the breaking of the, um, of the givens and, uh, and the release of the therapeutic, the political quest, political journeys, you know, breaking down forbidden fruit. So we're very distracted from, by the forbidden as being the source and sources of our activity to get rid of their, you know, a lot of people today, it's about making sure that nothing is forbidden, right? But you see, if you make nothing forbidden, but you haven't trained yourself to find wonder in the unforbidden, then when you make the forbidden unforbidden, you there's nothing there. You don't have the ability to enjoy it. It, it consumes itself in the very act of unleashing it. And that's not to say that some of these quests to make forbidden things unforbidden are bad. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying that if that is the only quest you have, if you do not have the cultivation of wonder in these different things that we're describing, which a new metaphysics, a um, uh, phenomenology of lacks, uh, plurgama uh, to a new metaphysics that you just got all the subjects of that. If you don't take those to heart, then any accomplishments you may have, any releases you may have, you will not um, have the ability of wonder to even see anything in what you've now made unforbidden, what you've released by the therapeutic. Um, and again, if we would learn to, as you say, uh, see wonder and beauty in the unforbidden things, sitting out on the porch, uh, being with your wife, working on your philosophy, just catching a really, just looking at something, like really looking at something, like just really taking it in. And then really thinking about the differences between the good life and the bad life, you know, really thinking about life suddenly becomes very expansive. Life becomes very full, but in that fullness, it never stops moving. And yeah. the invitation here is that uh, none of us stop moving either. So gentlemen, thank you for your time. I, I think it's been a joy. I look. For, I hope we can do more of it. Uh, we are really pushing our luck with two hours on the children not waking up. <laughs> this has been amazing, wonderful. Life is wonderful. Um, but uh, but thank you all. Thank you so much for all your work. And I, and I certainly hope that we can do more soon. And thank you for everything you're doing. And no doubt what you write and that you work on uh, will be magnificent. And we will certainly have to discuss it. I, again, I'm, I'm really taken by this question on the, uh, the privation versus the lack. I think that's fantastic. Uh, work on angels, Javier, the, the work, the YouTube videos, everyone listen to the YouTube video on, on dating and romance on all these different topics and Freud and cycle. Now, I think it's just really, really important. And as I hope this uh, symposium is made clear, hopefully one of many, is that all of this is practical. All of this is practical. If you take all that this discussion to heart, you will live a different life and uh, you know, your relationships will be better. Matt, Javier, yeah, you have better relationships. Yes, you will. Uh, so, so thank you all for everything. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, guys.